Last time on 999Z. Shit was about to go down, yo. Junpei resisted the urge to remind Santa that he would have to open it a long time, or he would have had it open a long time ago if Santa hadn't interrupted and quickly threw off the lid of the coffin. They peered inside. Contrary to what they'd expected, the inside of the coffin was quite large. It was mostly empty, but not completely so. Laying on the bottom was a rusty key, and next to the key... It's a g gun Yeah, a revolver. It looks pretty old. I wonder if this is a replica. Junpei reached down slowly and cautiously to pick up the revolver. In his hand it felt heavy. His chest he checked the cylinder. There were six bullets. He'd never seen a real gun or even a real bullet before. He couldn't tell if these were real or not. The barrel was rifled, and nothing seemed to be blocking it. As Ace had said, the gun was a very old one. However, it appeared to have been a well-maintained. If it was a real gun like Junpei thought, it would most likely function perfectly. If it was real. Holding the gun made Junpei feel... unpleasant. Carefully, he placed it back in the coffin. You're not gonna take it? Of course not. All something like this is gonna do is cause more trouble. It's a powerful weapon that gives one person a huge advantage. Something like that would be way too dangerous to have around. You're in enough danger already. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Maybe... Maybe Zero put this gun here hoping something like that might happen. In other words, maybe he put it here to make us fight each other. In that case, we should most certainly leave it here. I, for one, have no desire to let Zero control me. The others nodded. They had no desire to be under Zero's control either. Okay, we got that figured out, but you aren't going to leave that key in there, are you? Yeah, yeah, of course I'm not. Junpei picked up the rusty key and slid, up, slid the top of the coffin back into place. The gun back where they'd found it. A rusty key. Maybe I can use this. Let's just put this key in here and... Yes! Sounds like that did it! Yay! Looks like it's open, Jumpy! I see. This key should open the door. Hey, what are you waiting for? Let's go! Yes! It's opening! You found it! The hallway that left the cargo room started straight towards the stern. Junpei and the other three proceeded down it silently. Some distance along it, a large room opened up on the left-hand side. <clears throat> it looked familiar. An iron grate covered each of the elevators. Junpei and his companions drew to a, scot a stop and began to discuss what their next move should be. We've seen this elevator before. Adjusting seating. <clears throat> we got off the one to the left just a little while ago. Then we went through the numbered six door and that took us through the, to the engine room. Yes, and after that, we passed through the cargo room. And now we're back here. In other words, we made a loop. We're back where we started. Junpei approached the elevator. Gently, he pushed the triangular button on the wall next to it. A moment passed. The elevator door opened. And shut. Pushing the button had apparently restored power to the elevator. The elevator was now functional. What do we do? Should we return to sea deck? No, this hallway keeps going. Even if we do end up going back, I think we should see what's down there first. I agree, let's go. Their decision was made, Junpei and his companions left the elevator behind and continued down the hallway. Sometime later, Santa, who had been walking several paces in front of the rest, suddenly stopped. Set in the wall in front of him was a door. So far as Junpei could see, there was no other way to proceed. It was the door or nothing. All right, let's open it. Junpei took a deep breath, readied himself, then grabbed the doorknob and pulled the door open. That's pushing you, silly. He paused for a moment, then stepped through into the room. And there he saw the number that hung over their heads since they'd woken up. Nine. Like the numbers on every other door, this one too was a rough shape made of red paint. 
Its door was set into the back wall of the room. Junpei leapt towards it with a sudden burst of hopeful energy. It was a large double door, heavy and full of solemn importance. He grabbed hold of the door handle and shook. Nothing, but he hadn't expected it to open. The red sat on a wall next to the door. It's green, red, vacant. I'm gonna do some quick calculation. See if any group of three could go in. Five, six, three, digital rip. Obviously not. That's why we needed the one. And five, six. I don't feel like actually doing the calculations though. One, five, three. Well, that's sad for June then. One, six, three. That's obviously going to be one. Okay. The red on the wall sat on the wall next to the door. Its screen red vacant. Finally, they'd found it. Junpei felt himself overwhelmed by a torrent of emotion. At last, they found the exit, but cold gripped, but cold gripped his heart, and he knew what, all too well why. As he stood frozen, unsure of what to think or feel, Jumpy, look behind you. He spun around, and couldn't believe what he saw. It was a door with the number nine written across it. Was there a second door? Why? Junpei's voice was barely audible, even to himself. He stumbled toward the second door as if somehow compelled. It was a small single door. It sat in the starboard corner of the room on the same wall as the door that it entered from, but in the opposite corner. Nine. There was no mistaking it. A red sat on the wall next to this door as well. Junpei shook the door handle pointlessly and muttered to himself. Why? Why the hell are there two doors? It was Santa who answered. There were always two doors. Just think about it. Zero never said there's only one door with nine on it. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Of course, we just assumed that there was only one. After all, why would there be more? Oh, man. Jeez. Junpei was stunned. Zero's trick had taken him completely by surprise. There were two doors. That meant that all nine people who had met at the central staircase could exa escape and leave no one behind. Now the reason for the brace of numbers being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 was clear. Divided in two, the digital rep for both teams would be 9. For instance, 1, 2, 7, 8, and 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, the digital rep for both teams would be 9. Or 2, 3, 4, 9, and 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, the digital rep would also be 9. There were many other workable combinations, but they all ended the same way, a digital rep of 9. What did that mean? The answer was quite simple. From the very, very beginning, the nonary game was designed to save all nine people. Zero hadn't been lying. Zero had never said there was only one door. But anyone who'd found themselves in the game would have assumed that the case. Fights would, fights would have broken out. One team would likely betray or deceive the other. Someone might be hurt. Someone might get killed. But eventually they would reach the room Junpei now found himself in and realized the pointlessness of whatever violence they'd visited upon each other. There were two doors. No need to kill each other. They'd understand and be appalled, overwhelmed with guilt at what they'd done. Perhaps... Perhaps that was the purpose of the game. That was how the Nonary game was meant to be played. Fortunately, they hadn't started to fight one another, at least not yet. But if one misstep was made, if the wrong mistakes happened, mistakes would arise and the noose would tighten. The thought of it sent a chill down his spine. So, what are we going to do, Junpei? A voice broke through Junpei's frantic thoughts. Santa's voice. It brought Junpei back to his senses. No use worrying about the future. He needed to figure out where they were going to, what they were going to do next. There were four people in the room. Ace, Santa, Junpei, and June. Their bracelet numbers were 1, 3, 5, and 6. The digital rut would be 6. In other words, the four of them couldn't open a door without the, with the number nine. But what if there were only three? Could door nine be opened with three of them? It took him no time at all to determine the answer. There was only one combination of three people that would, that would give a digital root of nine. One plus three plus five equals nine. That would mean... No! Or no! We gotta go back! That wasn't a possibility he was willing to consider. Santa and Ace agreed. Hold on. Count. Seven, eight, four, six. Aw, oh, that's shitty. <laughs> yep, I agree. We cannot leave June behind. Junpei let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. 
Are you sure? I, I don't mind staying. June's body betrayed her true feelings. Her eyes were wet with the beginnings of tears and her legs shook. It's okay. There's no way we leave you behind. Santa had said what Junpei had known the moment he realized which three people could go through the door. Besides, I'd rather drown at the bottom of the ocean than escape with this sausage fest. Maybe I'll get to go to Atlanta. Uh, are you sure you don't mean Atlantis? Oh, right. <laughs> Perhaps it was the sudden reassurance that no one wanted to leave June behind, but Junpei laughed harder than he had in some time. Santa and Ace smiled. You guys... Junpei blinked he or June blinked tears from her eyes and bit her lip. She didn't seem to know what else to say. Very well. Best we head back to Sea Deck, then. We should be able to take the elevator we passed earlier. Perhaps Clover, Seven, and Lotus will have returned from door one. Even as Ace spoke, they knew finding the others wouldn't improve the situation. There was no way they could split into teams that could both go through the doors. Ace knew it. They all knew it. But there was nothing else they could do. They would find the other three and search for another solution. All right, let's go. Ace looked at all three of them, then turned and headed through the door. Santa and June followed. Junpei stared towards the door, then stopped. He'd been too busy with the other concerns to notice the room itself. It didn't seem terribly important now, but what exactly was it? Junpei looked around the room for the first time, noticing things that weren't doors with nine on them. A red carpet ran between two columns of wooden benches that ran the length of the room. The carpet began at the large set of, set of double doors and ran towards the bow, towards... Junpei wasn't sure. Was it an altar, perhaps? There was a small rectangular alcove at the end of the carpet, and inside the alcove was a raised platform. Resting on top of the platform was a coffin. A coffin. A coffin. What on earth was a coffin doing in a place like that? But before Junpei had time to answer that question... Hey, Junpei! The hell are you doing? Let's move! Santa's voice echoed in the hall from outside. In from the hall outside. Right, okay! I'll be right there! Junpei turned on his heel and left the quiet, somber room. They took the elevator up to Sea Deck. Once there, they headed back towards the main hall on the central staircase. It didn't take them long. Junpei found Seven and Lotus waiting for them. They didn't look happy. We've got a problem! Clover's gone! Junpei and his three companions looked at one another. He turned back to Seven and Lotus. What do you mean, gone? Santa, Ace, and June had their own questions to ask. When? Why? You two went into door one with Clover, didn't you? Seven and Lotus responded as best they could. Yeah, we w yeah we went through the door together. But Clover barely spoke to us. She just did her own thing the whole time. There were four rooms on the other side of door one. She wouldn't let us into the fourth room. She just said, I'll take care of this one. And shut the door. She must have blocked it with something on the other side. We waited for a while, but Clover didn't come out. We called for her, but she didn't answer. So I kicked down the door and we went in the room. But... It was empty. Clover wasn't there. There was a door on the other wall. And it was open. We figured she opened the door and left by herself. We ran after her, of course, but... Well, obviously we didn't find her. You figured that much out. Clover's gone. Junpei thought for a moment. When did this happen? We got here just before you. You certainly have excellent timing. So you haven't searched anywhere else other than near the staircase? No, we haven't. Finally, Ace spoke. His voice had an edge of resolve and concern. Very well, then. We'd best separate and look for Clover. We haven't much time left. Let's begin. There were quick nods all around, and the six remaining players spread out. Junpei and June ran into the Central's hospital room and looked around. She's not here. No, she isn't. They searched a little longer, but with no luck. They couldn't find Clover. Finally, they gave up and left the central hospital room.
Slowly, they made their way back to the hallway. At last, they reached the stairs, and Junpei spoke. All right, I'm thinking we should probably split up. I'll head back to the stairs and take the elevator down to E-Deck. June, you can take the stairs up the B-Deck. All right, that sounds good. But, um... What? Did you stop calling me by that code name when we're alone? Huh? Oh, sh sure, right. I'll, uh... I'll do that. There was a reason Junpei persisted in calling her June even when they were alone. Although perhaps not the best reason. He was embarrassed to call her by the nickname that he's used when they were children. Canny. Nine years ago, it came naturally, after all. Or it came naturally, after all, they were children. But now that they were adults, it felt strange. Regardless of what he might hope for, to call a woman he wasn't dating by such a childish nickname felt odd to him. Of course, to call her Miss Kodoshiki would be even more awkward, and simply Kodoshiki would seem a little bit, or a little brusque. And although I couldn't put his finger on it, or on why, it felt somewhat forward to call her Akane when they hadn't seen one another for so long. In short, it was simply easier for, for him to call her June and leave it at that. Alright, I'm going then. Or, alright, I'm going then. Yeah, be careful, Canny. June, or perhaps more appropriately, Canny, blushed and smiled. You be careful too, Jumpy. Yeah, got it. Take care. Junpei looked after her for a moment as she ran up the stairs. Check it out her ass! Not really, didn't say that. Then turned around and took off to the hallway. The reason I say things as in the sense, or as though you might not be watching slash actually reading it, is just in case you're not. Because a lot of this is just reading. <laughs> Look, I, could bet, I bet you could listen to this entire Let's Play and just imagine it. It'd probably be pretty... Or it might actually be pretty good, anyway. Tragedy always strikes when one least expects it. But to wait for a man to stand before striking him down seems almost crueler than dealing the fatal blow while he lies on the ground. A light in a dark place, June's pays... Or June's smile had given hope, both for escape and possibly for something else. It was that hope that raised his spirits just enough that they might soon be fully dashed. He opened the elevator door, and there she was. A woman sat, slouched against the wall. Lotus. Junpei felt his blood turn to ice. Her body was limp, and her skin, smooth and pale as always, was covered in bright red, red blood. Junpei felt his chest constrict. He couldn't breathe, and his legs began to shake. A slow, cold drop of sweat trickled down his back. He felt his stomach somersault. Junpei's mind went blank. All his thoughts replaced with endless hissing white. Driven by a little more than instinct, he began to walk towards Lotus slowly. Each slow movement of his stiff limbs brought him closer to her corpse. Finally, he stood next to her. Robotically, he bent down and put his hand against her neck. There was no pulse, no rise and fall of breathing. She was slightly worn. Something, somewhere in Junpei's mind, sha Junpei's shaken mind, told him that meant she'd been killed recently. Yes, Junpei thought, his mind slowly returning. She'd been killed. Someone had killed her. There was a deep cut on the left side of her chest. Blood still oozed from it, although clearly her heart stopped being some time ago. The weapon had been a knife then. Perhaps she'd been stabbed in the heart once. She would have died immediately. He took little comfort from knowing she must have suffered very little. Only then did Junpei notice. Lotus's bracelet was gone. Lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from this ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is broken or taken outside the confines of the ship, or detects that its wearer's heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. Was that why the killer had ended Lotus's life? so that they might have the number 8 bracelet? If that was true, then the killer was whoever wanted the number 8 bracelet. Perhaps more accurately, the person who would gain the most by obtaining the bracelet number 8. Um, let's see. 8 plus... Let's see, 9... These are the bracelets of dead people. Plus 2 equals 1. Hold on, that doesn't necessarily help much. Who is that? 
Who would benefit the most from the number eight bracelet? The thought had only just entered Junpei's mind when... He heard a noise. A sound like a sharp knife cutting through wet meat. It struck him as strange that the noise came from inside its own body. A moment later, the pain hit him. It wasn't merely pain. There was heat, extreme heat as well. He felt as though molten iron had been splashed against the side of his body. Finally, his brain made the connection. He'd been stabbed. But where? His body was quickly going numb. He couldn't tell where the knife had met his flesh. Given the circumstances, however, he'd most likely been stabbed in the back. Whoever had killed Lotus had now done the same to Junpei as well. <sighs> his voice was a little more than a weak groan. With what little strength he had left, Junpei turned his body, trying to catch a glimpse of his attacker. But as he did, the knife dug itself deeper, twisting viciously. <laughs> He collapsed to the floor, a puppet with its strings cut. His arms and legs lay where they fell, oddly twisted and awkwardly positioned. Junpei's body was entirely numb. He could feel the blood leaking out of him, but nothing would move. Nothing save his eyes. As he lay on the floor, his life ebbing away, Junpei finally saw his attacker. Two tiny images of the killer reflected in his eyes. With that recognition came nothing. He felt no emotions, not anger, not sadness, not regret. The paralysis that had claimed his body had reached his mind. His killer glanced down at his body. Then, without a word, climbed into the elevator and was gone. His eyesight began to fade. The world grew, blur grew blurry and began to dissolve into an empty white fog. The fog crept into the edges of his mind and worked inexor inexorably inward. Soon, it swallowed up the last that Jun remained of Junpei's mind, and his consciousness left him. There was nothing more. Into utter, utter emptiness, he fell. Into zero. Whatever Junpei had been was gone. Bad end. God, this music creeps the fuck out of me. Sorry for stuttering on some parts of that. You have reached one ending. This game has multiple endings. In order to experience all the endings, you need to save now. Once you've saved, you can restart the game with information you've acquired in this playthrough saved. Once you begin the game again, you can skip through the text you've already th seen. Simply press right on the control pad to fast forward through the lines you've already read. Once you reach lines you haven't seen or new choices, it will automatically stop. Memory of Escape has been added to the title screen. Memory of Escape enables you to play the stages you've completed. It is recommended to save after this in order to unlock a memory of escape. Would you like to keep the information you've gained during this playthrough? The data will be retained in your save file. If you restart the game, you will still start at the beginning. Yes. And now you can see what I was calling a potential spoiler, or like an obvious spoiler, at the beginning. Begin with memories. That would be this knife picture right here. This shows one of six endings, Therefore, and I already had like four of them, so I didn't want you seeing any of the other stuff. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me, this was one ending of the game. We will obviously be going to, or going through multiple times in order to show off new parts of the game. I'll probably just go through, like, I'll restart the playthrough, and I will go through the stuff that you've already been through, but I'll speed it up so my voice is all squeaky and funny sounding, and I won't, like, speak all of the lines again, because that would just take for fucking ever. Not to mention, now I can just hold down... Stop it, opening. Now I can just hold down whatever text I've already seen is going, and it'll just skip through all of it, basically. So. This has been 999. You saw the knife ending. Next time, let's see what other endings we can get, or what puzzles we can go through, because 
Well, I suppose... God damn it. I suppose it's not really a spoiler, because if you went through here, you could just click on these and see what puzzles we've missed. Door 1, door 9, door 5, door 8, door 2, 3, and yeah. Obviously, we missed the ones we didn't go through. But we can still go through them, and they are part of the... Or going through those puzzles also changes the story, obviously. Especially in the first choice, if, you, if I were to go through door 5 instead of door 4, which I will be doing in the next playthrough. Anyway, until next time. I was making a motion like a diaphragm, like kicking with my hands. Anyway, peace!